Great. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Thank you um, for your participation, your continued participation in the day. I hope um, the sessions so far have been really useful and that the uh, innovation sessions in particular gave you stuff to go back to your various companies with. And you've had some thought provoking discussions and also an opportunity to make some new contacts as well and, uh, and reinforce some of the contacts that uh, you already have here at Swiss Re. Now, this session is all about shaking things up, okay? I know it's very easy to get stuck in a rut and to uh, think about the competition being the person who sits next to you in the office, the rival boss who you think has now got a bigger team than you or a bigger budget, something like that. Maybe a competitor in the same industry. Well, this session is all about looking outside of that, outside of that whole thing and reframing the whole question about what's going on in your industry, where the opportunities are. And so in order to refresh your perspective, this session um, has taken some industry experts, all from outside of your usual uh, remit, all outside of the, the people that you might normally uh, hear from. And we want to hear today um, from you guys here on the panel about what you see as the benefits that things like digital ecosystems can bring to the insurance industry, what you think that they can offer the people in the room here, what everyone here can learn from some of the experiences that, that you've seen, some of the pitfalls, some of the challenges, and, um, and also where there might be scope for collaboration. I know there was a, there was a lady here who was sitting at the back earlier um, who was talking about uh, collaboration and talking about when you should know when to partner, when to go along with a, a new strategy yourself and when it's time to, to find someone to work with. So we've got four fascinating speakers here, all totally different backgrounds. Um, please welcome, if you can, I've got Professor Michael Jacobides who's just here. I've got Michael Davies here. I've got Alessandro Girardo here, and I've got Dan, who's um, from Swiss Re, who's going to be talking about the Swiss Re perspective. Um, we're going to start with you, Professor, if we may. Um, we talk about digital ecosystems. What on earth do we mean by digital ecosystems? Because it is a session uh, title for the next hour. And how can people in this room be using them? Absolutely. I think that what we've seen is that there is this new way of organizing, which we call digital ecosystem. So two things. They're digital because they take advantage of the connectivity that exists in all kinds of products and services. And they're ecosystems because they connect a number of different players that collaborate to give together some complex value add. If that sounds too abstract, think about your phone. And what happens with your phone is that you've got the device, but what the device does, and you're going to look at this device, is not have Samsung or Apple tell you what exactly you use. Uh, Android does not tell you uh, what are the apps you're going to use. But there is someone called the ecosystem orchestrator, that is Android for one ecosystem, that is Apple for another, that chooses who are the complementers, these participants, that together give you something that you, as a customer, value. Now that's different, because in the past, when you had things that needed to work together, you either did that yourself or you hired a system integrator to do it. That is new because you've got this orchestrator that says, I'm going to tell you what the bag is. I'm going to tell you who are these complementers that can come together. And that is uh, the source of power in the economy. If you look at the top 10 firms by market capitalization, you will see not just technology firms, but firms that are using these ecosystems, <coughs> household names like Google and Facebook and Apple and Amazon that rely on all of these partnerships. And the more these services become interconnected, the more we want to have simple points of access, the more we are able to access unimaginable uh, variety and depth of products, and the more we see the importance of creating these ecosystems. That changes the competitive landscape, and in a number of companies, we do see this transformation from the traditional sectors onto now areas that are mediated by these ecosystems. That also changes the landscape for the insurance firms themselves. Okay, um, Michael, listening to all of that, that all sounds um, terribly um, sort of 
overwhelming, actually, I suppose. You know, I'm an outsider in, to this industry, looking at that, thinking, good grief, how do I turn my business into a single point of access, tel a telephone, and get all of these ecosystems going? What is the most significant part of all of this? And, and crucially, what are the implications that the sector can take away? So I'm going to highlight three things and finish with what I think is the most important one. The first is um, these digital ecosystems are changing the way we move around the world, how we live in our homes, what we consume. So they're having pretty fundamental impacts on what the actual landscape of risk is. They are shrinking or growing or contracting or reshaping risk pools dramatically. So that's going to call into question for underwriters a whole variety of the historical data on which they've relied. At the same time, they're creating a bunch of new data. Um, and that new potential data does offer the possibility of co-opetition, this sort of strange balance in which you are both friend and foe, and you go do that. But I'm now going to be the, um, what's the right word? I'm going to be the- Harbinger of doom, I think. Harbinger of doom, the Cassandra. <laughs> I want to use an analogy. The real danger for the insurance industry is that it becomes the Iwo Jima. Of the, reinsur of the insurance, the, of the digital ecosystems. Refresh and everyone on their modern history. Iwo Jima is a, an island in the Pacific. And Iwo Jima uh, was the place in which the Japanese and the Americans decided to fight a particularly bloody battle. And one of the questions that came up in one of the sessions I was asked earlier is, we haven't yet seen the large scale digital ecosystems enter insurance in any significant way. And, and, I was motivated to say, well, the reason is they've had other battles to fight so far. They've been working their way up Italy, fighting the Battle of Midway, and at some point they will arrive in Iwo Jima, and they have the following characteristics. They're extremely aggressive because they have to compete with each other. They move extraordinarily quickly. They have really deep capabilities in the key things that you need to do underwriting. Um, and in particular, they have asymmetric economics. What I By mean, which you mean what? By which I mean they don't need to make money out of insurance. If it works for Apple in its battle with Google, in its battle with Amazon, to trash the economics of the insurance industry, they will go do that. Gosh. Wow. <laughs> Alessandra, I know you've been working in, in IT, in the IT sort of world for over 20 years now. I mean, w what conditions are necessary to succeed in digital ecosystems? Because it sounds like a pretty fearful and very bloody battle ahead. Let's say that um, in, in, the, in the industry, yeah, I, IT and also I, I work uh, in, um, for other, other industries than insurance, like... Uh, automotive car sharing all around the mobility that that's the this is the industry where i i got more let's say satisfaction from digital ecosystem business model you know and why did it work you know it worked uh, for many reasons first of all the digital ecosystem was really part of the strategy so organization strategy has digital ecosystem as as, as the core it was not just something on fashion or trendy but really part of the strategy. Second, they, were, they put also technology as a core of their, of their model. And uh, they could attract talent, entrepreneurial talent, innovative talent, because they, they put innovation and technology at the core of their, of their business model. Then they, they have the knowledge of the customer. They, on one side, they, they manage, they own, the, let's say, the customer data and, and, and they could uh, really understand what the customer were, were looking for, you know. On the other side, they were, you know, they really put customer centricity as, as, as the, the, the real goal of the strategy. And then, fundamentally, they had uh, already a network of partners to collaborate with, and they were already, you know, trying to work with other partners to achieve uh, new services to offer to their market, new solutions. So it was already in their DNA, you know, this kind of uh, partnership uh, approach. And so that was easier for them to be part of an ecosystem and, and, and take the value out of it, not just, the, you know, trying to change the, let's say, the business model and, and try to, to, to reduce the barrier that exists in, 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 the, in the normal work. So they, they really, that was, these were the, the real factors that I noticed that um, 
that could you know bring them to success okay yeah. Um, Daniel, um, you're the house voice today um, in this session. Uh, also, apparently, internationally recognised as an expert on longevity and health data. So, first question, what's the secret to a long and happy life? Uh, so, the secret <laughs> is to have very long-lived, healthy parents. Right. <laughs> OK, well, there we go. Answer in a nutshell. Uh, <laughs> the, my next one is, um, is really following up from what Alessandra was saying there. Um, a customer-centric and tech innovation at the heart of the offering. What is Swiss Re doing in this world, in this aspect? And are you fostering a network of partners? So, um, absolutely, Swiss Re believes very strongly in the importance of partnership, whether it's through institutions um, or whether it's through a variety of different research organizations that are coming together. But, but maybe the point which kind of draws on what Alessandro is saying, but also linking to you, Michael, is although digital ecosystems will fundamentally change the world of insurance, um, risk is not going away. Risk continues. In fact, in many ways, risk gets more difficult. Um, because instead of having relatively straightforward policies which cover a period of time, um, which are organized in terms of verticals, you actually have a whole mesh of various different elements to an insurance policy which covers your entire customer journey, uh, or genuinely, you actually, or literally, your, your journey. Uh, and that meshing it together it is not something that the consumer will say, oh, fine, it, it's got more complicated for you. Um, we accept that, that this is going to be a difficult experience. We expect it to be perfect. Uh, and, and that means that increasingly two things. One, the reliance on more and more real-time data to support the understanding of that risk. But second, and this is the really important part from an insurance perspective, the focus on not assessing the risk but reducing the risk, and reducing the risk um, with, with the individual. So providing them transparency over how they've been assessed and what they might change that will improve their risk, or what might change um, to the person who's bundled the insurance into their product. So sometimes it will be visible to the individual, sometimes it will be visible to the company, but at all points, it's the transformation of increased data to better understand what will be increasingly complicated risks that will actually underpin insurance. Okay. Can I just pick that point up? Because I, yes, think, by all means, I think that's central. I, I want to highlight, I laid out one scenario for the future. If the insurance industry can figure out how to cooperate effectively with people who would otherwise be competition, to pick up this idea of cooperation and, and this sort of strange um, duality, then it has huge value to bring to bear. But it's not just the flow of data of predicting the risk, it's closing the feedback loop and changing the risk. Because that creates real economic payoffs. It creates a pool of money that is available for distribution. So we're not just fighting on a commodity about making slightly better predictions and slightly better prices. We're actually creating real value that way. Reducing the level of accidents, reducing the instance of burglaries, reducing the damage caused when things happen. All of those. Well, another thing that I think is going to characterize the competitive landscape is that <clears throat> we see the emergence of a small number of different sets of needs that have people that are trying to cover them. One is mobility, and other one is mostly transactions, and probably wealth management is separate from the one transactions. Uh, and one of them is going to revolve around safety and security. We have not seen someone that has taken a good offer to make people feel more secure in the stuff that they do. So what we said about digital ecosystems is that now technology allows you to do things that before you were not able to. So it allows you to combine uh, your activities with the data that are provided to the insurer with the possibility of offering real-time recommendation or guidance, which means that insurers for the first time can really deliver on these value-added services. At the same time, they need to evaluate and assess the actuarial conditions that are changing, which means that they need to develop a set of new skills because the nature of actuarial science, the way that it was developed for insurance, is backward looking and trying to gather the data that provide over a reasonable length of time some fairly robust evidence in terms of what's going to happen. 
we need models that are much more uh, reactive to the experiments that are happening, that are much more sensitive. So I do think that that suggests a change agenda for the insurance on two levels. First, understand what are the needs, and then with what kind of relationships will you be able to offer the complex web of needs. Two, understand what are the new skills, because the products will also not have a product placement uh, perspective, they will also have a risk measurement and assessment in areas that we do not have sufficient precedent, which means that we will need to change from the actuarial science probably to data science, which is going to be much closer to what AI firms are doing right now. So it is an area ripe for disruption. Mm. I do expect that we're going to see winners and losers. And just to put it in a very abstract way, what had happened in financial services in particular is that it had a comfortable life, despite the misgivings of people that it didn't, because it, based, it was based on the exclusionary principle. People could not break in, whether that is banking or finance. We have seen that the road already in banking, and you see the banks bleed and fintech grow, yep. because we now in, have in the FCA a regulatory sandbox. We have very similar things happening in insurance, where the regulators say, sure, bring it on. Let's find creative new ways of putting it together, which means that the comfortable life that was afforded to insurance firms, because others were excluded, is going down. We have new opportunities for adding value, and we have new skills that are needed for assessing risk. So I think that strategically, and of course it's very easy to say when you're a strategy professor, but strategically it's an exciting time. Now for you, it's a bloody difficult time because you're like, I like comfortable life. Well, this is it. And this is what I think lots of people will be thinking about here, um, clients, potential clients. It's all very well knowing that these potential opportunities exist, that they can get better data, better value, better value for money in terms of their products. But timing is everything. Just to uh, Ian Walker's point, uh, who I met in the break earlier, who is um, a client of, of Swiss Re. Um, it's very difficult to know when you should try something new, to what extent you should try something new, to what extent you try uh, new digital ecosystems. And no one wants to get burnt by tech that goes wrong. So, Dan, how would you advise someone like Ian thinking, oh, you know what, this sounds good, but I don't know what I should be adopting and when? Sure, and, and I think it, it becomes um, easier to, to experiment and to test out new ideas in in parts of the insurance where you expect there to be significant change. So, so one particular area um, we have relates to business interruption. So looking at providing insurance when, when something goes wrong. But historically, that, that has always been something where you look at the historic pattern and then, and then you predict based on that very macro level what, what the issues might be. An experimentation in the area of better understanding what supply chains look like. Uh, and, and the dangers related to a, a particular breakdown in the system, which impacts on a particular company, by looking at what data might be available, by seeing how that data might be accessible, it might be through the blockchain, it might be through um, provided partnerships, that, that gives you an insight to compare the type of solution you might get from using that different source of data, that different component part of insurance, and compare it with what you already have. And, and that is an area where um, it's a natural kind of development to, to explore what the new data, the new technology might provide in preference to maybe looking at a completely different risk, which you've never considered before. You know you're going to have to, to, to modify. You know you're going to have to change. And in that setting, you might choose a particular industry. You might choose a particular area or geographical area to experiment, to test, to kind of test and repeat and fail quickly, uh, hopefully test, repeat, and succeed occasionally, <laughs> um, to get that insight. So bite things off in small pieces quickly, rather than say, I am suddenly going to develop a whole new system of insurance in an area I've never been interested in before. That's good advice. Um, Alessandro, you mentioned a sort of more customer-centric focus being one of the key drivers of success of people adopting digital ecosystems. Traditionally, the insurance industry has gone to its clients and said, you need this product, you need this great new thing, and it's going to cost you X plus Y. Why 
is there any impetus for that to change? Because really, if you want a customer-centric business model, a customer-centric uh, product or service, you need the customers to be driving what it is that you're trying to sell them. Yeah, the customer insurance, we always talk about the customer journey and how the, the touch points are very, very little. Normally, there are two, you know, when you open the policy and when, and when you, get, uh, you get paid. So, so this, we, in every convention, in every discussion, we talk about uh, increasing the number of client touch points along the journey. But uh, in reality, uh, I haven't seen this happening right now. So, so where, what I mean by customer centricity is really listening to what the customer requires in terms of, for example, mobility as a service, as, as, as they mentioned, you know. So the, the customer, many customers now, they, they don't, even in London, you know, you don't, you don't need to, to own your own car because, you know, in London you, you probably use uh, private transportation or you use uh, car sharing or you use any kind of, you know, mobility on demand. So this is a need that the customer asks and I haven't seen, probably, I'm, I'm wrong, but I haven't seen insurances really taking a further step in this direction. While, for example, th this example where I, where I work, you know, I, I, I'm working, I've, I've been working, I'm still working in this uh, electrical car sharing company that uh, on one side they have, they're, they're looking for the beneficial result that is uh, identifying the crash because many people are using car sharing and they don't declare the, the crash because they don't want to get the fee. So there is a, a, re a good revenue now for, for, the, for the car sharing, but on the other side, for example, they want to to, to fight this uh, fear of, being, uh, of using an electrical car because you have the fear to, to, to be stuck because the battery you know, goes down. So what, what they ask me to do is, uh, first of all, using machine learning to be precise in the, in the um, definition of the life of the battery. So when someone is driving a car, the number of miles he can still drive is correct, and normally it doesn't happen. <laughs> Second, using machine learning to identify where to put uh, electrical recharge charging station along the way, so understanding where it's more convenient for the customer. Third, uh, um, using uh, the moving park in the car where people need it. You know, if if you if you you know with, with a, this this fleet, uh, you can you can check where where people are, are, are driving, you know. You know that uh, car sharing uh, is used two hours a day, the rest is parked. So where to put this car, these two hours a day, to, to be more used, you know, for convenience for the final customer. So the goal of this project was really to find uh, good services for this final customer to, to, to motivate them to use uh, electrical car sharing instead of the normal car sharing. So I'm sure there is a final objective of revenue, but uh, it, it's providing good services to the, to the people. And then we were going ahead and say, okay, given that an electrical car is not, uh, you know, producing pollution to the, to the city, so what shall we do? So we added uh, a sensor that is uh, testing the, um, the pollution level of the city so we can use the car that is parked, it is not used as a car sharing, as a, as a let's say, as a, as a sensor for pollution level and provide the services to the city. So, you know, you can do so much mm. if, if you build, of course, in this, what do you need? You need a, a, a company that is giving you the map. You need a telecommunication company for, you know, sending the, the data. You need uh, the support of CareMaker. You need uh, an IT provider. You need uh, a, a provider of uh, black box and the sensor. So, so the ecosystem is, is building. The more you go ahead with new services, the more you need to add a new partner build the ecosystem, and then at the end you produce many services for the citizen, for the end user, for the company, for the key provider, so it's a, and it's a win-win, multiple win solution. So that's uh, listening to the customer to, you know, th that's a real case, you know, of course it seems to be ideal, but. but yes, <laughs> no, I, I was just thinking if you were sort of a small or medium-sized business listening to this, that sounds incredibly complicated and costly, trying to work out who, who all these partners are. We do want your questions, so do feel free. We've got some great panelists here, and it's not often uh, the insurance industry gets minds like this all together in one room. So do think about your questions and do um, put them to our panelists. Um, now we, I think we've got a slightly better understanding of ecosystems and how they work. Um, Michael, I know you look at all sorts of different industries all the time and um, and you're on various government panels and all sorts of things. And where do you see the 
opportunities, the specific opportunities for insurers when it comes to digital ecosystems? There's a couple of different things. Um, so just to take on, uh, on continuing what Alessandro was saying, uh, if you think about the experimentation that's going on and take mobility as a good example, why? Because I think it is a telltale of things to come. Uh, we have shifted from the traditional consumption of cars to uh, having mobility and that now changing the behavior so much so that people between 18 and 35 are 20 some percent less likely to go for their driving license. Now that is an indication of the desire that people have to have services that are convenient for them. The rest is a little bit up for grabs. Who's going to be managing it is up for grabs. So one possibility is that people who think that they will combine the electromobility and the good um, uh, environmental conscience uh, with a way of monetizing it are going to create something. That something will need also insurance because there is a new set of risks. So the first thing that I would say is that with experimentation and with the changes in terms of the business models comes the possibility of having insurance first vis-a-vis -vis the final customer. So the final customer will need to find some way of being insured in ways that we have not done so far. And the second thing is that business partners who enter such deals may say, that sounds fine, but I want to limit my exposure to what I am doing within some realms. So I think that both on the B2C or ultimate B2C and on the B2B side, there could be some opportunities where insurers will be called ultimately to engage in some shape or form. The second thing is that, again, that the product development process for those that are in the insurance pros, uh, business needs to be much more interactive than it has been so far. And the reason for that is that if they are not, they will soon realize, to go back to what Michael was saying earlier on, that others want to have a sliver of the cake. Now, they don't care about the same economics. And I think that a good analogy for that is what's happened in the payments industry. I remember I was working quite a bit with the banks um, about a decade ago, and I remember the discussions about what would happen in payments. And I can tell you that at least in one of the major banks' boardrooms, I said, they were like, well, look, at the end of the day, these fancy new things, they're not going to be more than 10% of the market, and look how slowly they're growing. They're technically not entirely wrong. Well, it was 20 some percent of the market. The problem, though, is that the pricing just went totally down, and the market become, became unprofitable, and the banks realized that they could not defend their profitability. Why? Because they've got a very different set of economics, and also because they are changing the customer expectations. So now what you have is those with the data who say, I'll find some way of offering insurance. Tesla said that, uh, well, guess what I have? I've got these sensors, and by the way, the fact that everything can be downloaded in your car. Michael, I think you have one, so you can share I some do. details <clears throat> on how that works. Um, everything that uh, works in your car is wonderful, seamless. You don't have to think about that. Happens in the background. Put your signature here, and coincidentally, Tesla is going to have all the um, data in the world because it'll be able to develop autonomous driving better. It'll be able to assess risk better. It'll be able to differentially price more. So right now, you have this other interesting battleground that is ownership of data. And then the people who are closer to the data may say, you know what, insurers, you are just friction. We can do a similar work with less friction. Why on earth do we need the old-fashioned, stodgy bit? Let's leave it for a few old-fashioned, stodgy customers. And for the vast variety of them, we can do something much more fun, much more snazzy. And we don't care about the economics of your business. So I think that in order to avoid that, you need to be proactive. And look at the transformation in sectors like uh, the automobiles. If you think about mobility, and if you now look at what the major OEMs are doing, uh, about five years ago, they were all just generally speaking about it. After Uber was valued more than BMW, they all freaked out. But now it's a very different landscape, right? Uh, now you have Mercedes-Benz going with its deadliest rival, BMW, that have banded together to offer an upscale mobility solution that is soon enough going to start competing with uh, Uber because they realize that in a world where you have mobility, what on earth do you want the differentiation in terms of the car quality? And uh, if you look at the map, you know, CB Insights and others create maps of relationships, uh, you can see that there is a vastly increasing web of relationships 
of these maps, and some research that, that I did with, with BCG a, a short while ago, we looked at the successful ecosystems, and we did see a positive correlation between number of industries, uh, number of countries, and success. So we know roughly where the future will go, because some sectors are already further down that path. And I think that it is qu quite close to an inflection point, both in the customer value proposition and also in the risk assessment with data ownership, a huge part of the story, and regulation will have a role to play. Yeah, it certainly will. Um, Michael, I know, uh, I mean, uh, certainly starting with your, your introductory thoughts, I wonder whether we have already reached that inflection point. I don't think we're quite there yet. Let me pick up um, a couple of the, the points that Michael was making. Um, in one of the, from one of the discussions earlier this morning, this question of Tesla came up, um, and there was some discussion about car theft. Um, in the US, which has the better part now of a million Teslas running, there have been 213 thefts. Wow. And 211 of those vehicles have been recovered. So Because everyone knows where they are. Because everyone knows where they are. And the two or three which have not been recovered went off the grid, were powered down, they believe they were dismantled for parts. Mm. Um, because the parts themselves have some intrinsic value for repairing. So it basically means if you're thinking about what I was saying about changing risk pools, that means that theft as something you need to insure for, for a fully connected car, basically goes away effectively as a risk. You might have to pay a little bit for you know, 200 thefts in a population, the better part of a million is, is negligible from the overall point of view. Um, I'm a fan of Tesla, how's the car going? Uh, I have one of the original <laughs> ones and I love it. I'm sorry, well, for all sorts of reasons. <laughs> not, not leaving aside the fact that it's faster than a Ferrari and seat seven. Um, uh, the, but I want to pick up and, and bring two teams together. Something that Dan was saying and something that Michael was saying about where we are on the timing um, and what you should go do as a result. Because insurance is not a product that people necessarily have in the forefront of their mind, because the touch points are some distance apart, we don't see some very rapid behavioral change. Okay. Moving around a city like London is an hourly or daily challenge. So if a good service comes along, your behavior modifies pretty quickly. And I've been watching the battle, for instance, between Uber, who announced yesterday that they're going to include transport uh, TFL information in their app. Yes. And they're doing that to fight City Mapper. For those who are not from London, if you want to get around the city, go download City Mapper. It is the answer. It is an order of magnitude better than any other way because it tells you what all the possible uh, answers are. In the insurance industry, lower salience, lower purchase frequency, change not necessarily in most sectors as rapid, leaving aside some of the areas Dan identified in which it's a new service, it's a new consumption. So what I, in general, say if you want to divide the world up, you don't necessarily yet need to make a great big business risking, life changing big bet. There's a whole bunch of things you should definitely go do, however, and in particular, you should be making significant investments in experiments, in building the capability to understand that. And that doesn't mean that you need to go develop AI from scratch. The issue with things like AI and machine learning and these enabling technologies is over the last year or two, They've reached the point of maturity at which they are robust and businesses can make use of them. And this is an adoption and diffusion problem, not a technology development problem. And it's a mostly a management change a challenge. And I've been doing a whole bunch of, of work looking at why it's being used, where it's being used, what the impact is. The barrier is overwhelmingly not whether or not the technology works. It's whether or not you know how to apply it appropriately. And it's both being underapplied in some cases and please don't do this. It's also being overapplied by a bunch of people who are taking projects that should be done by straightforward data science and sticking an AI label on it because they can get it funded because it's the fashion of the day. So there's a whole bunch of people who should be investing but in But is that not stuff. the better thing? Get it no. in, get it done. No, because we've got a desperate shortage of skills and management bandwidth. And if you go and try and apply AI to problems for which that particular flavor of AI is all suited, and there is, I'm, you know, in this public forum, I'm not going to name names, but there is Go one on. particular company who did enormous harm because they have had one of the early AI pioneers who made a big deal about their platform and how amazing it was and burned many people in the industry. There are multiple projects, each of which cost tens of millions of dollars because it was not the appropriate use of the technology, but it was fashionable. So make the investments, 
build the capabilities, build absorptive cap cap capacity, understand what's going on, be a user of the technology. You don't necessarily have to be a creator of it. Right? And then you will be well prepared for when the change happens. Just quickly, before we... Look, I can see everyone's desperate for questions. Can we get some questions from the audience? Because uh, as lovely as it is being up on this stage, it'd be <laughs> lovely to hear some of your thoughts as well. And then we'll, I promise we'll come back. No. Oh, well, we've, got, well, we've got one over there. Hi. Um, so when we think about, when we think about ecosystems, I think we also think about who orchestrates and thinks of the orchestrator as being a sort of a pole position. Is there a way to talk to or to think through a way that you, know, you need to just sort of step back and allow somebody else to orchestrate and just be horror, you know, a commoditized product provider? You don't need to do that. If there's an economic bottleneck, if you control a key part of an overall ecosystem, maybe the person who's doing the organization, all of the organization, is not necessarily the one that captures all of the value. The question is, what's the bit that determines the overall performance of the system, right? Like the, the nature of the solution, how good it is, how effective it is, how low its costs are. So there are businesses in complex ecosystems, which are specialized niche providers, that make a great deal of money by just being very, very, very good at one thing. Hedgehog rather than fox. Well, I, let, let me give a, a complementary um, approach to that. Two things first. Yes, there is a strategy of being a bottleneck as opposed to an ecosystem. So you focus on being the bottleneck in a complex uh, set of products. The problem that I've seen in some of the organizations that I've worked with, though, is that they all start the conversation wanting to be the orchestrator. And I think that that is more often than not displaced, uh, misplaced. What I was saying earlier on is the importance of insurance being embedded in ecosystems, not saying, I'm going to be the center of it. So my concern is that when people speak about ecosystems, they get one letter wrong, and it's the letter C that they change with the letter G. It's an ecosystem. It is, <laughs> if you know, seriously, you ask them to, uh, I, I've been in more than one exercise where you're like, okay, great, let's figure out um, what the ecosystem is. The firm is in the center. You have Facebook and Google and the other tech firms. Somewhere in the distance, you're going to have your client, and the ultimate client is sort of lost in some sort of shroud <laughs> of unknowability. And the problem is that ecosystems are the exact inverse. What happens is that ecosystems are the result of the fact that industry boundaries and firm boundaries are dissolved. And frankly, if we redesigned the world today, we would not stick with the structure of insurance as it is at this moment. So people say, great, now I can innovate. What does that mean? It basically means that you need to change your perspective and rather than think about yourself as an orchestrator and think everyone else around you, the question is how can you entrepreneurially embed yourself in a number of ecosystems and find a way of leveraging your skills. Let me give you another analogy here. Think about the world that used to be sort of in like normal children's toys for one purpose. You know, you've got a dollhouse or you've got a, a, a nice little tree or something. The world is moving right now to something which is more like Lego bricks that can be used and reused and you need to think about how you embed yourself in different areas and how you can be successful as a result because it is there is something worse than not engaging with ecosystems which is to delude yourself of having the amazing grandeur that everyone needs to be around you which means that you will both waste money and you will waste energy and nothing will come of it so i think that that's a very important cautionary tale and let me also emphasize what michael was saying a number of small investments, and that's where, unfortunately, corporate culture does not help. No. Not any of the big companies. What, for instance, even the automobile companies, think about what they did. They invested half a billion ahead in each of their ventures. Crazy. Now, it <laughs> panned out because all of these now are valued at totally ridiculous multiples that I think will not be here for long. That's a totally different story. But they did that because to build a new model, you need half a billion, and that's the way that they thought about it. By the way, even Apple has failed for the same reason. Apple's Siri used to be leaps and bounds ahead of others in voice recognition. And because Apple is a customer um, product service, which essentially means total secrecy, 
reveal at shows, total secrecy reveals at shows, it was not able to do the small alterations that all the other competitors were able to do. So even the big firms that we admire simply extrapolate what they've done. And I think that for both insurance and reinsurance, we need to simply ask the questions, of how do we do it? And I think it's not big bucks, but it's a broad scale that to me is more likely to succeed. Okay. Um, Dan, do you think big companies such as Swiss Re are ready to lose the ego? So I, I think we all must be humble. But I, I, I have a, a particular concern, which is highlighted by the way that, Michael, you were describing the, the challenge that, that faces, which is I, I don't see this kind of necessary, this direct transfer of risk from the insurance industry to, to tech players or whoever. I, I see something a little bit more dangerous. And, and that is based around information asymmetry. Yeah. So if, if you fundamentally believe that you have a nice relationship with XYZ company uh, and they are largely self-insuring, but there's one class of insurance that they're very happy to continue to provide to you, run for the hills. Because <laughs> they will have information insight on the individual risks in a way that your historic data will be very difficult to unpick. And you will find that what they're using is your balance sheet to write that risk that has to be written for legislative reasons rather than taking internally. So um, we're very familiar with the idea of information asymmetry between individuals and insurers, between companies and insurers. We need to be aware of unpicking potential insurance opportunities when the reality is that that company has a much better insight in the risk. Now, the ways that you could get around that, the ways you can understand that, is that you are very much part of, of the, the ecosystem that supports and is run by that company. And exactly to your point, avoid the ecosystem of tracing up your own independent lake and get involved and say that the price of us providing this insurance is seeing the data. Um, sorry. No, I was going to say my favorite, uh, go, to go back to the earlier question of Uber and CityMapper, City Mapper managed, there's a fascinating story here. City Mapper's advantage that has always had, and this was a deliberate part of their strategy, was they have an information asymmetry relative to anywhere else. They don't, they, what they know is not, I want a car to get from A to B, it's I want to get yes. somehow from A to B, and they leveraged that in two stages. They first set up a bus route, and they went to TFL and they said, you don't have enough buses here. And TFL went, oh, it's a bus. No, you can't run it on demand. It has to have a fixed schedule. It has to have fixed stops. And then their great innovation was going back to, and this is exploiting thinking about the regulator, they went back and said, we'd like to run a car sharing service with very big green cars, right? 15 person green cars, <laughs> right? And they went, oh yeah, you can, we've looked at our rules and you can have a 15 person green car that stops at bus stops. So if, for those of you who don't know it, that is, has been an enormously successful launch. And I find it fascinating which Uber, who are so good at evolving this, are being outrun in London by someone because of the data asymmetry. Because City Mapper's data about who does what, where, when, and why is way better than Uber's in London. And the, the, the issue with information asymmetry is that for insurance, uh, the information that could be used is a byproduct. So this is important because uh, what we see with the explosion in terms of information, you know, people speak about Moore's law. It pales in comparison if you look at the volume of information this world is producing and the cost of storing or transmitting this information. Why is this relevant? It is relevant because it is giving us an abundance of information that was not available before, and it is giving it as a byproduct of other businesses, which means that there is someone with data that can do stuff. So if the insurance industry is not ready to find a way of organizing it and at least taking this part, not orchestrating all of it, but capturing this bit, someone else is going to say, tell you what, we can do it in a better way with whatever is left over for the main business for which we have this data, which is to have a seamless integration, to add value, to do whatever it is that we uh, want to do. Talking about the, sorry, Go on, no, quickly. Just, just talking about data and back to machine learning that uh, Michael was saying, you know, machine learning now, you know, in the last five, 10 years, is stable, it work, works. Yes. You know, in the past, it was very something very cryptical, very dark, but and, and with the amount of data, the, of new data that are available, you know, it, there is no, 
before we were only using statistic and the historical data of, uh, from actuarial department. Now you, have, you can have real-time data, you know, when someone is driving with a smartphone application, you catch the data and you, you, what you can do with machine learning, you can do prediction. Prediction is yeah. what is, is changing really the, you know, the, the, the analysis of the data. You can do prediction of driving style in T0, in T you, can, you can predict how it's going to be the driving style in T1. You can do prediction of predictive maintenance, so you can avoid a car to break down and save the cost. You can do prediction of, uh, of, of, of traffic uh, using, you know, after a month that you, no, even three, after three weeks you, you, you check uh, the, um, the trips of a person, you know exactly the habitual routes. Yes. Uh, and you can predict uh, on the routes, you, you can give services on uh, prediction of a weather forecast, you can give uh, advice about a better route to go somewhere, if there are accidents on the route. So, so you can give lots of new services through prediction. Uh, prediction can help also to customize, uh, to seg better segment your customer and provide new services that you were not thinking before. So what is bringing, what machine learning is bringing is really prediction that before were not used. And prediction of new real-time data that you can collect from this device, you know, really is, is explosive. So that, that's what, what should be done. So we say not only actuarial people, but uh, insurances, they need uh, data scientists. Which sounds excellent. I mean, it sounds like it's a win-win, doesn't it? But who in the room feels a bit overwhelmed by all this? I mean, I know I, I certainly do. I mean, all these opportunities, all these avenues to explore. How is anyone in here expected to understand where to go, which service to go with, which is the hot new thing, where should we be going? I mean, uh, you, Michael, have said it's just about, you know, it's little investments, little bits here and there. But, well, know. sufficiently big. I'd start with, I think the wrong thing to do is to take a technology and try and find a way of applying it. There's some fundamental principles which you'll go, which is go look at the economics. Go look at what works for customers and what their pain points are and the rest, and figure out how, given what you know about, you can use these technologies to solve for those problems. My, my classic example, Dan's heard me um, talk about this too many times, is I'm sure somebody in the room is familiar with Carrot here in the UK, which was a technology company that desperately tried to sell a telematics solution to all the incumbent insurers, and finally, despite the fact they were a technology company, decided to start their own insurance company because they couldn't get anybody to buy the technology. And that's interesting because they're not just predicting the risk. It's not just better prediction. It's behavior modification. So there's a particularly important point which I want to drive home is in some cases, one of the things that technology is doing that I would highlight is technology is enabling the much more widespread application of behavioral economics. You cannot you, it's not just that you can predict the risk, it's that you can change the risk, and you can change the risk in real time, and you can figure out what the signaling and feedback loops are. And the combination of pervasive digital technology, cloud services, robust machine learning, and an understanding of behavioral science means you end up with a very powerful combination of technologies. Let, let me combine that, because I think there's one more layer, because you may have the idea, you may have identified what the opportunity is. The next question is, how do you put it together? And so let me share some experiences. I, in October, I spent a day uh, with uh, Helvetia, and what is, what's interesting to me is that I, I, the morning I met the board, you know, traditional Swiss, you know, uh, board of the, uh, the, the 500 people running Switzerland. Uh, <laughs> I think all of them were, you know, in, in Some of which board. might be in the room. <laughs> uh, yes, but, uh, and the afternoon was with the senior leadership, the C-suite, and the uh, late afternoon was with the working group. The board, very thoughtful, you know, they engage in thorough diligence in terms of the acquisitions, and uh, they had bought Manipark, one of these, in order to build an ecosystem, one of the the biggest broker in mortgage uh, loans. They were trying to think about how we can be able to build an ecosystem. We've created the group, but we are the super tanker and we have the speed boats. These guys are the speed boats. What is it that you think? And we had a very interesting discussion with the board of Helvetia and what they should do. At the sea level suite, it was really interesting because I spoke to the uh, chief technology officer and said, look, I like all of these ideas that we hear about these ecosystems, but if we believe that we are moving in a modular future and these guys are trying to figure out what are the modular solutions that the ecosystem is facilitating. I know nothing about that, boss, because I am putting capital every three to four years, which is, you know, Helvetia is a big player, so they outlay a reasonable amount of capital in their IT services, and this is not part of my brief. 
So you saw that the sea level was interested in, but they said, it's not really connected to my own stuff. And then you see with the working group, and the working group had a bit of the, we can offer this to the customers. And I asked them, yes, have you asked what the customer wants them? But they will, won't they? And you know, <laughs> it is the same challenge that you have with people who are super excited to do something new, then they get, they convince themselves in a and the people board, will come. insular group, <laughs> and then that everyone is going to come, you know, clamoring for that. And I said, well, I want you to close your eyes and tell me who is the customer that does not say, oh, Helvetia could give me all these things together and I can work with Raffaizen and they were explaining all their links. What's your storyline? In simple words that I can tell my auntie. And there was a bit of a problem there. So I think that the issue is that even in organizations that are down the path, and even when the board you know, does the reasonable investments, wants to open up, you need to align both the C-level suite in order to say, how will we connect the uh, speedboats to the super tanker? Because otherwise, you're going to be in Xerox Park territory. Xerox invented the Ethernet, invented the GUI, graphical user interface, invented the mouse, invented object-oriented programming. None of that stayed inside mm. because the speedboat was isolated from the business. And the final thing is this externally focused team because you get some bright, ambitious, you know, 20 and 30 year old somethings with the occasional older, crustier person. You need to do something that makes sure that we get a bit more movement than that. And I think that we have the both where and the what, but we also have to think about the how and the changes that are required in the organization. Absolutely. Do we have any questions from the floor? Can I just add one point to that? Uh, uh, yes, we, is, we brought some very talkative ones up here, didn't we? One question, it's a one-liner. On. Most new technology ventures don't fail because the technology doesn't work. Overwhelmingly, they fail because you're not building something the customers really want. Some of them fail because of the team. Just keep that in mind because I think that's central to what Michael was saying. Mm, okay. Um, just on that point, how many... Big insurance players, do you think, will exist in 10, 15 years' time? Fewer. What kind of percentage are we talking? I mean, we've talked about it being at or near an inflection point. We're talking about how the, in, the people coming in, the big competitors, couldn't give a damn about the insurance industry and don't necessarily need to make any money from it. I mean, how much carnage are we talking, Michael? Mo both Michaels, gone. <laughs> I think in the medium term, significant, and the reason is that underwriting, uh, as developed within existing insurers and with the economies of scale that has been developed, will not be efficient uh, to keep other competitors at bay because it has to do with the way that you process information. So I think that we're going to see a combination of consolidation. I think that these are technologies that and we've seen that in banking as well, right? I mean, you see big players that invest in these technologies like JP Morgan, massive amounts of money, and that are getting some advantage. I think that we may get more of that. So expect some consolidation, and I expect a bifurcation, i.e. changes of the models with slightly more bulge bracket and more specialty shops that are relying on the others. Uh, that's not going to happen, that's not going to start tomorrow. And interestingly, that I think is going to be even more because of this part two that I mentioned, not the value proposition bit, but more of the underlying data and the way you use data to predict the future bit, which to me is a big, big part in, in the insurance business. More in insurance than in reinsurance, I think. Generally. What would you say, Michael? I will come to you, don't worry. I want you. to pick up the, the, the last almost, it seemed like almost a throw line, but begin there. Um, at the moment, Distributing and delivering insurance is extremely costly. When you look at the, um, the performance ratios of insurance companies, um, often the loss ratio is down at, in the 60s or 70s, and the difference is made up in the fact that 20 or 30 percentage points of every premium in, for many direct insurers is, is going and getting products to the customer and back. That is a recipe for really large-scale consolidation because of taking that cost structure out. And I th I'd agree completely with Michael. I think that you will end up with a few very large players who have broad scope, who can make the investments. And this is typically the way ecosystems evolve and a number of people who are very strong specialist players. But being a mid-market generalist may be a really hard place to be over the medium to long run. And that you may end up with quite a different industri industry structure as a result of that. 
Alessandro, who do you think are the going to be the big players, the big competitors in, in tomorrow's insurance world? Retailers, for sure. For example, in Spain, one of our biggest insurance companies, client, is uh, Le, Corte, Le Corte Inglés. That oh, yes, is, uh, of course, yeah. yeah. So we have, you know, we're working the distribution insurance and he's one of the biggest clients. So I, w I was really shocked when I discovered, but that's a really... Because, so I think retailers are, for sure. And, I guess uh, all the customer yeah. data they have. Yeah. 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 Of course, they they know they know very well the customer because they have all the historical data and uh, and they have a very also very, very large distribution. They're, they're very how do you say capillar capillar in the capillary no. <laughs> Yeah. So that's that's uh, and then of course you know talking about Amazon you know this kind of big uh, digital big players that are using digital ecosystem since uh, as a as a real business model so they, they they can they can invade this space and already moving into the insurance yeah, space they are, as well they are, for sure. yeah. yeah um go on then dan what's the the case for for staying with a big insurer what's the case for for remaining with you know a, a big bulge bracket uh, reinsurer and 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 partnering up with you sure i mean something i think we we've slightly glossed over is the fact that the world is underinsured. Um, the risk yeah. that there is is significantly greater than that which is currently held by the insurance industry. We see that when we have natural catastrophes, the economic losses are vastly bigger than the insured losses. Um, the difficulties in achieving insurance penetrance is, is, is true in multiple lines, and that is before we even start to talk about new risks, whether it be supply chain, whether it be cyber, etc. So the difference between what could be insured, whether it's through embedded products or, or whether it's through um, more conventional approaches, is enormous. And, and so therefore, the question is probably not how many large insurers will there be, but are the names of the large insurers of the future the names of today? Yeah. Uh, and I think there is no doubt that regulation will continue to ensure that there has to be a certain number of insurers. Of course. Uh, and regulation will also protect, to some extent, those insurers that currently exist. My concern is a little bit that which is expressed by, I think, all the other panelists, which is that um, those who are caught by the wave and are of a certain size and believe that they're taking on risks because they have invested a small amount will be the ones that get burnt. So a little, name, a little knowledge is a very dangerous thing. What I, what I particularly like is there are a number of insurers around the world who are actually dramatically bucking the trend. They're the ones who are actually selling tech to the world. Um, people like Ping Ai, et cetera, their solutions, their insights in terms of better understanding risk are used by the public sector, are used by other companies. Um, it would be nice in a relatively short period of time to see that actually technology coming from the insurance industry is actually something that others want to use and adopt rather than insurers always having to feel, well, who am I going to partner with and I hope they don't burn me along the way. Amen to that. Thanks very much. Thank you to all our panelists. Um, it's been really great, really interesting getting your insights. I know we could chat for hours, but I'm sure uh, everyone has got other things they want to be doing. There are drinks afterwards. I just wanted to wrap up quickly with um, a few sort of final thoughts before I invite Simon back onto the stage to close proceedings formally. Um, I think this is really interesting. Um, you know, when people say, oh, you know, oh, what, what are you doing on a Tuesday? Oh, I'm going to do an insurance event. People think, oh, God, that's a bit boring, isn't it? This has been fantastic it's so interesting and I think what's what's really striking is just how ripe for change the industry is how welcome change would be and how uh, to your point Michael some of the barriers are not the tech not that the tech doesn't exist not that the expertise don't exist not that the skills don't exist or the right people to Alex wherever he is in the room I think he moved oh, there he is uh, you know there are people there are already the new generation of underwriters and beyond uh, in existence the tech is there it's the adoption of it and the capacity for cultural change as well I think is, is really interesting whether or not the industry I think will be dragged along kicking and screaming because it has to be or whether there will be some specific event something akin to the financial crisis but for the uh, the insurance industry that makes 
everyone had to completely reassess their business model. I do not know. However, one thing is for certain, 10 years from now, the industry will be completely different. I think everyone already recognizes that in the room. Um, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much for your company today as well. I hope you found it useful. I hope you've got something out of it and I hope the uh, innovation sessions went well as well. I'm just gonna hand over to Simon to formally wrap up. Thank you. Thank you.